The Myth of Jesus with David Fitzgerald. The uh, Satanic Temple. They're like PETA. I, I, tell, I tell people they're, they're like PETA. They're like PETA for minorities, women, and, and like children whose parents want to send them into therapy because they never were molested, but they need to be in order for the mother to get custody. They're the nuclear option for separation of church and state. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I'm, yeah, I'm big fans of those guys. Lucian Greaves, their founder, I'm a fr friend of. And uh, did you see um, Hail Satan, the movie, they documentary they made about them? Uh, no, you know, I, it's going to be my favorite documentary, and I'll be so emotional about it because I, I, was, I was like, I mean, I was this far away from having the Lucian Greaves idea because I, I realized <laughs> oh, the Sub no. so Genius Cult was a great idea. Yeah. And I was yeah. actually attracted to 60s and 70s erotic, like Hammer horror and amicus oh, horror goodness. like british sexy uh, vampire satano yeah there was a big occult revival in the 60s and 70s where like every night gallery episode had something with right? cards or astrology in it <laughs> so yes i was raised in that in that genre and and so someone yeah. finally realized that you could have good socialist politics plus the, the fun of a sarcastic subgenius cult, <laughs> plus the good eyeliner and, and leather jacket the fishnets of the <laughs> satanic movement all together yeah it's a perfect storm. What a great idea. And every time those, <laughs> those jerks say, oh, yes, you know, we're, we're allowing this here. We're, we're allowing this. So they have after school Satan and they have, they have their, their, their war memorial, which is that upside down helmet. There's, yes. there's nothing satanic on it, but still people get upset. Oh, and, and the other yeah. day, remember someone said that some gigantic cross was actually a secular cross. So they dubbed it the <laughs> satanic cross. So, so, nice. so, so, so they flew their members down to, to uh, an, an, op an opening. So it was a christening of, of this gigantic cross. That some bullshit local legislator said that it's not actually a cross it's shaped like a cross but it doesn't do with christianity so grieve said oh okay we're calling this the uh, satanic cross of bakersfield or whatever it was <laughs> so they had billboards and advertisements and everyone was flying into town to, to participate in the satanic cross of bakersfield ceremony <laughs> oh oh uh, look even more satanic goodness check this out hello <laughs> hello <laughs> Nice. Uh, David Fitzgerald is the star of this show, and my intention as the somewhat producer of the show for this uh, for this series is to um, really give David the, the the center stage because the the series is about the the myth of Jesus, and um, I think it's for me as somebody who entered into the into the new atheist conversation, uh, I would say about six or eight years ago. Um, that's how I was introduced to, to David. And, and David, why don't you start off by introducing yourself and tell me a little bit what kind of propelled you in the beginning of all of this to start such a, 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 a an amateur, serious, serious amateur, light scholarly kind of, you know, work with, with, uh, with this particular problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll jump right into it, actually, because I'm really only known for just a few things, and this is one of them. Um, I'm a writer and a historical researcher, atheist activist. Um, and about 20 years ago, actually a little more like 22 years ago now, um, as a happy atheist, I'd been an atheist for 16 years, and it never once crossed my mind to question whether Jesus existed or not. Um, and I got um, curious to try to figure out when we when you read the Gospels, the first thing you notice is reading one to another, their Jesuses are all very different from one another. And um, so as an atheist, and again, I had no, I didn't even know there was a, such a thing as Jesus mythicism. Um, I just was curious to know how, if it was possible to parse out all the, the real Jesus and separate all those elements that have been added on later as legendary accretion. Uh, long story short, so I started looking into this, and one of the first things I found out was that there's all these red flags that pop up when you try to compare the gospel Jesuses and keep their story straight. And you quickly have to pick and choose which gospel you're going to trust for the real Jesus. And I started realizing that uh, other people had noticed this too, to the point that there had been people over a hundred years had been questioning whether Jesus existed at all. And that just blew my mind right out of the water that that could be such a thing. And yet the more I was looking for parsing out the real Jesus, 
sooner or later, it got to the point where I realized about two years later that I don't think this guy existed at all. And again, I was by far from the first or the most qualified to start thinking along those lines. And Raphael, uh, Raphael, I guess, um, the the pastor? Pastor? yeah, mm-hmm. so he's really interesting. He's kind of been off the radar on a YouTube th- series, but he's, um, it, it, I, I got excited about looking at some of his stuff. I thought he'd be a perfect guest to bring into this, Absolutely. into this conversation, right? I could not agree more. He's, he's fantastic. Okay. Yeah. And, um, so I'm reading his bio, you know, he's, he's, you know, he's lectured on the subject and, you know, I mean, you cite him in, in your to be released book, I guess, or it is, it is, uh, released. I can't, I'm not sure if you gave me a snippet of your book to be the released, sn- but the snippet I gave you is from a chapter called why mythicism matters. And it's, uh, one of the contributions to, uh, John, W. Loftus's and Robert Price's uh, anthology on mythicism called The Varieties of Mythicism. And that is coming out this year, knock on wood, hopefully, uh, if if not this year, next year, depending on how much COVID has wrecked the publishing schedules of around the world. Uh, Oh, so you got to contribute on that book? Oh, yes. Oh, Oh, yes. Wow, that must have been exciting, hey? Very, yeah. I was was super honored to be asked to do it. And uh, it was, uh, I feel like it's one of the best contributions I've ever made. Uh, sort of why mythicism is important in a nutshell. And, I, you know, actually, on that note, I want to say mythicism really doesn't matter in a lot of ways. You can be an atheist and not be a Jesus mythicist, because it's not like if it turned out there really was a guy named Jesus, suddenly Christianity makes sense. That's just not the truth. That's not the problem. Um, I don't I'm not a Jesus mythicist because it helps my atheism. It has nothing to do with my atheism. It's simply that did the math and it just doesn't add up for me. And that's, I've been doing this for over two decades now, and that's only grown stronger. Um, In fact, one of the points I make out, uh, I make in the chapter that I, I, uh, of the book is that it's not just Jesus that has this problem. It's not just Christianity that has these problems. And I did a talk recently for, um, the Global Center for International uh, Global Center for Religious Researchers International uh, Conference on the Historical Jesus, and I made the point that um, when you go through all the top ten religions and a few more also rands like Mormonism and the Baha'is, um, all of them have the same problem of their founding figures look like they are completely made up, one hundred percent. And I'm including Muhammad in that. And that blows my mind uh, that somebody in the seventh century who has, uh, you know, to- tons of uh, family trees attributed to him, tons of history attributed to him, it looks like Islam started before he was even born and was finished 100 years after he died. Um, and we could talk about that. We could do a whole series on just that. Well, uh, let's turn that controversy way down, David. I mean, yeah, we're just exactly. trying to get people past yeah, Jesus yeah. here, right? Off the you know, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's just stick with Jesus. <laughs> but I notice in your like, like the intro in your book, or like the inside covers of your book, you have stuff like um, a, a Mormon story and several yeah. volumes. Tell me about why you like. How did you? Why did you structure it that way? Not necessarily the Mormon, but the volume structure. I'm curious right. how that evolved. Well. Um, I started, my first book was called Nailed, 10 Christian Myths That Show Jesus Never Existed at All. In fact, I have a copy of it right here. Okay. Um, and uh, after I wrote that book, I wanted to start a new series called The Complete Heretic's Guide to Western Religion. And the first book in the series, I would wanted to write a book on the Mormons for a long time uh, because I had a lot of information on them. And I've got a cat who's just bound and determined to chew on the cord, holding this whole thing together and pulling the whole thing down um, uh, because I had a lot of information on the Mormons uh, as a, a atheist and an ex Southern Baptist. That was one thing both halves of my brain could agree on that Mormons are all going to hell because their religion is completely wrong and had lots of fun putting together that book. And so if, uh, if there's any Christians out there who hate my books on Jesus and the historical Jesus, read my book on Mormonism. You'll love that much better. Uh, after that, I wanted to continue with the the series, I didn't want to make it sort of a religion of the week. So I thought, oh, you know what? I'm going to do a book on the historical Jesus as part of the series. But when I was done with the book, I was talking with my um, audiobook editor, 
uh, he's saying, okay, it's it's this many it's, it's this many pages long, so it's kind of big. And it's, he says, well, what's the word count? I said, well, about a quarter of a million words. He says, uh, a quarter of a million words. Is that six by nine or is that eight and a half by eleven? And I realized, oh, right, I have to shrink it down for book form. So it turned out it was uh, it was like 900 pages worth of book. So we had to break it up. That's why there's three volumes is because it was all originally one book, but we had to break it up into three books. And so instantly the series went from one book about Mormonism to one book and three books about the historical Jesus. Well, that's interesting because you write in a way that's really approachable and it's, it's almost, um, uh, it, you know, conversational, you, you know, you, you change up the tempo, you ask questions, you kind of throw in a flavor and a personal zeal into how you're actually writing. So this isn't just 900 pages of like stuffy, um, you know, very consistent type of thing. This must have kind of killed you a bit, you know, that's uh, no, a lot of writing. I, I mean, I, first of all, I'm delighted you say that because that's exactly what I set out to do. And that's why I feel like I bring to the table because I'm not a PhD in these things. I'm a total amateur. None of these are my ideas. Maybe there's three ideas out of the, all these four books that are mine. Um, and those two of those are probably something I just read once and forgot that I'd read it somewhere else. Um, that's what I bring to the table is being able to break down these ideas that are in thick, you know, scholarly, theological, uh, biblical history books and break it down to the nitty gritty in a way that's fun to read because I'm fascinated by the subject. It really blows my mind to see how this whole enchilada we call Christianity came together. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, and uh, people seem to think it's fun read and I have a funny sense of humor and yeah. uh, it's thoughtful, but snarky and snarky, but thoughtful. And I think that's a good And still respectful too, right? I mean, we were talking about Bart Ehrman the yeah. other day and he's someone you look up to. Um, yeah. right. As a scholar, I know Scott does as well. He's a, you know, he's a, he's a very well respected. Did you, and I'll, I'll let you guys know on a secret here. Yeah. I actually, I asked him to join us on the show <sighs> and he, he, <laughs> I want to say, so he accepted, what? but, well, what? but, oh. but, but he told me that there was a cost and I had uh, to pay. So <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had a feeling that's where the story was going to end. <laughs> so I can't it? remember how much he was charging, but it was something, I don't know, slightly more than a thousand dollars an episode charging. or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I tried to say, well, we're, you know, it's, it, you know, it's, it's David's show. It's not my <laughs> show. Just go on. <laughs> <laughs> but that that's how we kind of roll here too is yeah. that we're trying to make it more you know yours than it is ours because you know you've got the idea you've got 10 years anchored into this right and 20 even 20 um, yeah but i'm really glad you you reached out to bart airman because as you said i'm a huge fan of his and i've been saying for over two decades now that for somebody who's such a staunch historicist He's one of the best mythos scholars out there because I feel like his work and uh, Raphael Latticer backs me up on this as well, d backs up the mythos uh, approach at least or better than his own idea that Jesus was just another failed apocalyptic prophet. Um, I like that. And you, you, you see, that's the thing. You'll use the phraseology or you'll use the phrase consistently. Right. And mm -hmm. so another uh, a, a proc of, uh, sorry say that again i'm stumbling another failed about. apocalyptic prophet right another failed apocalyptic yeah. prophet yeah and, and you use those exact words so you it's it's deliberate mm -hmm. and you know hats off to you on that right so you're not yeah. just breaking down a, a concept you're actually really taking some time to you know to summarize his position that's good Absolutely. i would yeah yeah i would never want to straw man his position um and i feel like uh, one thing that's very interesting about Bart is when he wrote his book, Did Jesus Exist? We were disappointed. The mythicists in general were disappointed with it, not because we expected him to agree with us, but we thought this was going to be the best defense of historicity and at least clear all the deadwood from the crappy mythicist theories out there. Because there's a lot of crappy mythicists out there um, who you know think things like the Romans invented it, that Flavius Josephus invented the whole thing, uh, just things that are just patently ridiculous and if you're smart enough to concoct them i don't know how they're not smart enough to see how it fails um, mm -hmm. and how how much 
uh, religious evolution there they have to ignore um, to to make that scheme work. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I would say I was the least of the three out of the three of us, the least of a fan of of, of Bart Ehrman, especially on that particular book. Um, I had watched a few of his um, courses on the great courses. Yeah. And also the I read through that book and I, I think it was maybe the wrong book for me to start with. I think so, because it's probably his worst book. I think, and I say this with all love, I mean, he's written so many books that I absolutely love and are must reads for anybody. Um, but that one feels like he phoned it in over a weekend just to weigh in on a subject because he doesn't engage with any of the arguments that mythos are actually making. He, he really did a bad job with that. And in all his books since then, you see him backing away from some of the things that he was very adamant were well-established and firm facts. And he's starting to realize that things that he was relying on aren't quite as firm as he, uh, as he intended when he wrote that book. And to be fair, he was writing uh, forgery and counterforgery in Christianity at that same time. And that is a brick of a book, 700 plus pages of awesomeness. Um, mm. So I really do think he just, phoned it in on a weekend and uh so i have an idea with well, phone in on the weekend it seemed like he was just annoyed with that argument that it seemed yeah. like i'm not really going to give this some serious type exactly. of thing i'm just gonna exactly. have someone stop bugging me about this and exactly. i'm just gonna kind of like go through the ridiculous arguments yeah um yeah. and i wish i wish he had done even that you know and wish he i wish he did you know anyway and, well, I, I have an idea. I have an idea okay. with Bart here. Okay, so we start a GoFundMe or something like that, and <laughs> we say we're looking for some money so that we can afford Bart to come on our show. <laughs> we'll see if you know Raphael has a has a fee. We could lump that in there too. But I don't think he's going to be more than Bart. I mean, he could charge something. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. Bart's, Bart's you know? a heavy hitter. He's a heavy. He's hitter. a heavy hitter. Yeah, yeah, he is a heavy hitter. And, and you pay for that, but yeah. Well, David, when you were uh, remarking that uh, Bart Ehrman is partially mythicist or, or has a Jesus that's mostly mythicist, it, it occurred to me that maybe there's no way to clearly distinguish between the mythicist theories and non-mythicist ones because it might be a continuum. And on one end, there would be stories that match an actual person named Jesus. And then as you move, you'll have his name is Jesus. And um, these, things were, these things were exaggerated and changed over time. And then eventually, on, on the other end, you, you'll want to say it's entirely mythological but surely there was someone, some itinerant somebody onto whom this stuff could have been mapped. So really, is there, is there finally a way to distinguish between a mythicist theory and a non-mythicist if you allow that you can add more and more mythological stuff and still say there's something like a colonel, even if it was just one homeless guy one day who got in trouble during <laughs> Passover and was arrested. I mean, well, there's got to be some historical colonel that you can map all the mythological stuff onto. I think you're onto it, and there is a spectrum, but it doesn't involve whether this historical colonel, in my humble opinion, doesn't involve whether there was a grain of truth in the center. It's everything we know about Jesus doesn't have anything to do with anybody who really existed in the first century, whether or not there was a real kernel of truth in the center. Whether there was a real Jesus or not, whatever you think of who that was, do does the writings that we have in the, the Gospels reflect any of that? And I think that's the thing that we're all, you know, for as much as mythicists are considered a pariah, we're not. We Most of the arguments that historicists are making, we're totally in agreement with. The priority of Mark, uh, the synoptic problem, all these things, we just take our conclusion slightly different, uh, slightly further. Um, and the point we would make is, even if there was a Jesus, for all intents and purposes, there isn't one anymore, because the writings that we have do not come from eyewitnesses or anyone who could actually nice. be Oh, okay, that, 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 that really clears up a lot. So there may yeah. have very well been a, a historical Jesus, but what you're talking about is the, yeah. is the mythological Christ figure and saying, right. That thing has no hooking into into the historical exactly. and into the real. But and there may have been a real important. Jesus of Nazareth who these things were spun around, but you're yeah. kind of removing that issue and you're talking about yeah. what's who what's the person that people re refer to when they say Jesus? It's this exactly. set of of uh, myths. Exactly. And for me, hmm. well, I'll say there's professors out there like Kurt Knoll who says the point's already moot. It's it's the question is already moot whether there was a Jesus or not, because we can explain all the development and origin of Christianity, we can see whether there was a guy named Jesus or not. It's all there for us to see. For me, 
when I see the way our scriptures come together, what they say about Jesus, how obviously they're taking from here and here and here, scriptural midrash, uh, they're taking it, they're they're taking stories and, and bits from other stories of the, from the Old Testament and turning it into a story, a new story. for uh, right. and, a, and they even uh, announce it. This happened so that it might be fulfilled. Yes. That. Yes. Know, it's, 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 I mean, how, yes. How, how could the other leave that in there? It's like a yeah. giveaway. It's like yeah. we have a laundry list of things that we need to match. Find anything having to do with anything right. with this dying God thing that right. we can map on. And when you start plugging, when you start pulling out all the things that are completely unhistorical, that could never have happened as presented, and there's a lot of those, and pull out the things that are, oh, well, clearly this is an, an allegory for this because he's quoting it word for word. You know, Jesus' last words in the Christ, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When I realized that that was the opening to the 21st Psalm, it was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> hey, that was one of my first red flags. Um, and that's by far not the only one from, from his birth to his death and everything in between. Another thing, um, when you look at Christianity before his bio biographies are written before the gospels are written and after his uh, biographies are written it's two very different animals in fact it's many different animals before then and it's many different animals after that but uh paul and his generation talk about jesus in a completely different way than anybody does until mark writes his gospel which seems to be a complete allegory from head to, from start to finish a complete allegory so, so what was the jesus like for paul before the gospel stories a figure that was hidden in heaven and spoke to him through visions and revelations and scripture. Um, and what he meant by that was he would search the, the Old Testament scriptures, the Jewish scriptures, and where it's got Zacharias saying this to so-and-so, it's really the spirit of God speaking through his son uh, there. And we see this a lot, even with figures like Clement, where they quote what Jesus said, but their quotes don't match up anything in our gospels because he's quoting something that happened in the Old Testament as if Jesus said it. Mm. Yeah. And those are the kinds of things, and there's, again, so many of them that I've written four books about it, where you see that they're creating a Messiah, they're creating a character out of the scriptures uh, in ways that the Old Testament, we could even talk about how the Old Testament recycles the same stories over and over again, so that Elijah is a, like a second Moses, you know, Joshua is like a second Moses, uh, uh, Jesus, you know, th these, there's doublets and triplets with Abraham and, and Jacob, and uh, the same stories are getting told over and over and recycled, and this whole thing is being carried over into the New Testament for Jesus, um, and uh, yeah, in such a way that it's, it's impossible for me to take seriously that there even could have been a guy named Jesus, because if there was, he had nothing to do with the biographical information we have about him. Okay, uh, going back to your, your comment on Paul. So uh, for Paul, w was he seeing this as a essentially divine character? Totally because divine. That was speaking to him totally. through like synchronicities or inspirations yes. or whatever it was. And or, not, or only that, not only does he never have an idea that he was ever on earth, he's always talking about the Lord is going to be coming any minute now. Lord's going to be coming. He never talks about Jesus coming back. He's always talking about Jesus is going to be coming. And when he does, it's going to be a whole different thing. No time to get married. No time to, to make lots of money. It's going to be, you know, TikTok. It's coming. It's coming. So, uh, so but doesn't Paul say that, that he, he was tasked with the responsibility of actually persecuting Jesus or people like Jesus? Wait, well, there were definitely Christians. There were definitely believers in Jesus movements before that. But when we look at what those were, they look like they were a Jewish version of the mystery faiths not Jesus's friends and family, because for him, he never even uses the word disciple in any context at all, uh, let alone says that Jesus had 12 of them and they were his pals. The people we think of as Jesus's friends and family, like Peter and, and, and uh, James and John, uh, the Jerusalem pillars, he says, I don't know who these guys are. These kind of some kind of fake Christians. And they're, they're, I don't, I didn't give in to them for a second. When you read his Galatians, uh, everyone brings up that verse where he says, I didn't meet any of the apostles. I only met James, the brother of the Lord. And then the very next chapter, he's talking about how James and those guys, who these losers in Jerusalem are, you know, some kind of fake Christian. He doesn't know who they, they are. Um, it's like, 
are you talking about Jesus's number one disciples? And you're, you're opposing them, you know, and bragging about it and, and uh, talking about how you didn't give in to them for a minute. And yeah, it just, it's my So, so how, how did Paul understand the Christians that he was persecuting? How did he understand their relationship to Jesus? And, and who did he think they thought Jesus was? Hang on two seconds. Cat, get over here. Over here. Um, if you read the book of Hebrews, it seems to be a lot of the kind of thing that Paul would have been preaching at his time. A, a divine figure that was in heaven that spoke to people like him who could divine what he was being said in the scriptures and had visions of the risen Lord. And there's a laundry list in, in uh, the New Testament where he talks about uh, the people who have seen this risen Lord. And Christians use that and they say, oh, look, see, there's proof positive. But what they don't get is when you read that list, it doesn't match up to our Gospels at all. And it describes people like uh, James and the uh, apostles and Peter and the apostles as if they're separate groups. It's very, very, very weird. Um, and it, again, it doesn't match up anything that we've got in our Gospels uh, at all. So, so these pre-Gospel Christians, the Jesus that they worshipped, was it someone— uh, uh, that they understood that actually was born and was actually crucified nope. and nope. died and resurrected? Nope, not at least not in an earthly setting. Um, we've got a book called The Ascension of Isaiah, where it talks about a Jesus who goes to the seven heavens, and each time he goes to a lower level of this heavens, it's he's died and crucified and, and wakes up on the next level, basically. Oh, that's and awesome. He, he fools the demons there to kill him so that he can descend layer by layer by layer. And there's even verses where if they knew that they were crucifying the Lord, they never would have done it because, you know, they were falling into his, his awesome God plan. Oh, my God. And that's right out of Jesus, Paul's letters, too, that, you know, it wasn't uh, earthly authorities who uh, crucified him. It was spiritual authorities and so this cosmic, Gnostic, ratings, cosmic rulers. And, so, yeah, so this the Gnostic, prince of the power of the air, you know. Right, so this, this descending Jesus... What was his ultimate plan? Was it to redeem us because of yep. Yahweh's sacrifice yep. to man? Was it yep. the same story? Absolutely. And we have to be careful about what this original Jesus was because, again, there were different movements. And all of them, that, you know, some of them didn't have anything in common at all uh, with each other. And some we would never even recognize as Christianity. When you look at, like, the Gnostic writings that we have from the third century, um, if the Nag Hammadi writings had not come to, you know, been discovered, we would have no idea how wiggy and fractured Christianity was even 300 years after it was originally meant to have started. Um, but the the first Christianities um, seem to have been a Jewish version of these Hellenistic mystery faiths that we had so many appear in like the first century BC, that period. Uh, up this, to, up, yeah, Mithras, Isis, uh, you name it. Um, all these rebooted pagan gods were rebooted. They were they the the pantheons was an old worn out idea, but the new sexy idea was these a uh, personal savior, and so they would take these, uh, you know, Iranian gods, these Egyptian gods, and they would turn them into the, uh, a savior figure for their cult, um, and it would be a personal savior. Sometimes they'd have things like baptism and a lord or a lady's supper that they shared together. And, and 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 they would save you, and they would dwell in your heart and be with you, and you'd have a new life. And the person who baptized you would be your father. You know, um, things that sound very familiar to us. Um, what did saving mean for them? Be, like, like 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 for the for the mystery cults, what did saving mean? And for these proto Christians, what did saving mean? A, a life after death. A life after death. Yeah. Good fortune in this life, uh, but for sure. Uh, 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 life afterwards because as all these different gods had conquered death in their own way and they were all different so you too by uh, being in their cult would uh, conquer death so i have a question on the the i the idea of the the pantheon and the movement towards the personal savior yeah. what um h how would you describe the 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 dionysian effect coming into that because it seems like this melange of everything and right, right. yeah the these the Eleusinian mysteries uh were like the first of these mystery faiths and they go back a long way uh these were major religious movements even before the hellenistic period 
Um, it's not until uh, till that period that you see them start becoming more widespread and mainstream. Um, and you see Christians try to say things like, oh, well, all our information about the mystery faiths comes from like the second century. So clearly they copied Christianity. And that is just the most ridiculous thing you can imagine because Christianity was invisible socially for hundreds of years until Constantine, uh, until the third century when, when the Roman Empire started going downhill. That's when this little uh, apocalyptic cult that was totally on the fringe started becoming more popular. Yeah, there's I, one I, thing. I have, tri- I have a trivial question about the Constantine thing. I know this is disputed. So did he believe what he was saying? Or is this something that he signed on his deathbed and he didn't give a shit or didn't even know about it? That's a great question. I suspect, well, here's the thing. Throughout his life, he became the Christian emperor, but there was never a time when he was not also the pagan emperor. Um, And he deliberately used symbols like, you've you've all heard the story about how Constantine saw the vision of the cross in the sky and that converted him to Christianity? Well, he never told us that story because that was a bullshit story that Eusebius invented in like the fourth or fifth version of his biography. But it wasn't even a cross. It was the Cairo, a symbol that was both Christ's monogram and it was also a pagan symbol. And we see a lot of that, that he does these things that are both Christian and pagan. Uh, the fact that Jesus, uh, his birthday turns out to be on the son's birthday you know, those kind of things were not, didn't happen by accident. They were all by Constantine. But again and again, we see that kind of playing it both ways. And when he gradually shifted his favor to Christianity, um, he, it was a huge windfall for the the uh, empire because as he shut down these temples to these pagan gods, well, you're not going to need your golden idols anymore. So we're just going to take that back to the state and, you know, and, and the rest is history. Uh, so, so everything he seems to have done seems to be extremely politically calculated. Uh, I want to make a point too that yeah. you know everybody's everybody 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 bristles a little bit when it comes to um, oh well this is a you know somehow it's been contrived or we borrowed from here and it wasn't you know it, and there's other forces that contributed uh, or influences that contributed to the particular story. Yeah. And the thing is, is that. You know, even the 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 Abra- all the Abrahamic traditions borrow. I mean, even the oh, Jewish absolutely. faith from was was not created in a vacuum. It was absolutely. in a Hellenic vacuum. Oh, we can do a whole show right? just on that. We can do a whole show on that. And to be fair, don't think I'm picking on Christianity or even the Abrahamic faith. They're all like that. All yeah. Like that. Um, they all all their roots go way deeper and go into other religions and. Uh, and again, and, it it seems like all their founding figures are completely made up. No, and they no, were a lot more lenient back then about being creative. Uh, say um, again, like myth makers in their communities, yeah. and they were a lot more lenient. To this this yeah. idea that the text is pure and cannot be altered that we associate with with Islam this, this is really reaches a peak in in 17th century Germany. The Protestants were the ones that really wanted to make the text yeah. actually from the higher dimension. And, and, and cultic practices were supposed to be really crappy, dirty, uh, uh, low-level stuff. But the early Christians, according to what Ehrman says, they realized that, like, the Matthew group, they were Moses, a finer Jesus, and they were okay with that. They saw it happening live in real time. And uh, what the, uh, the the Luke group saw that, that he was being, like, you know, the, the, the food laws don't really matter. He was being, like, a cosmopolitan uh, savior. And so, so the people sitting in that circle listening to the storyteller knew that the storyteller was taking liberties and it wasn't scandalous. It's only and, text worshipers that think that the idea of creative myth making is scandalous. And there's two things behind that too. Um, there's also the possibility that um, when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote their gospels, first of all, they weren't trying to write their gospels. They were each trying to write, write the one true gospel. Um, they liked Mark's gospel, but they wanted to fix it. And they wanted to change things that he got wrong. Uh, Matthew's constantly fixing Mark's mistakes, and Luke's, and they're both changing. Luke and uh, Matthew are both changing Mark's original gospel to suit their own theology, but they keep the majority of it. John barely even tries to make his gospel match up with the other gospels, and yet he's still working off the basic germ of a story that he got from Mark. Um, and it's fascinating to see that uh, that whole 
uh, dynamic at work. Um, so the guys who wrote this, they had no qualms whatsoever to change it. In fact, Luke is the only one that even claims to be writing history. And that's a lie because he's mostly just stealing from Mark and Matthew um, and putting in celebrity names from the time uh, and stealing from other uh, authors like Flavius Josephus. And we can demonstrate how he's borrowing from them. Yeah. Um, I often wonder what was the official like moral sense about this issue of making stuff up? Because Gregory Chopin points out in, in, in early Buddhism, like there's, there's that transition from, uh, from uh, the, what, Theravada, Hinayana to, to Mahayana. It, it was really, it was because monks were irritated about the fact that they were just doing plumbing, carpentry, gardening, <laughs> car and they weren't doing any meditating anymore. So they would make up these new, the new lost lectures that the Buddha gave on Vulture Peak recently discovered. Yes. So you think, oh my God, how could those monks be so immoral that they would, they would uh, forge false lectures that never happened and then put Buddha's name on it? And the answer is, they were expected to do that because it was an act of humility. So what you would yeah. do is uh, when you and your friends were in the dorm writing up new stories, you wouldn't say, look what John and I did last night. You would say, yeah. Yeah. look what the Buddha revealed to me, all glory to the Bingo. Buddha for having done this. Bingo. And yeah. scratch out the name Buddha and put every single other religious tradition on the planet, and they do the same thing. Um, Western religion, Eastern religion. Yeah, you see the same thing. Um, yeah, yeah. And again, I'm, I'm resisting going down that particular rabbit hole. Uh, but I want to go back just sl slightly. One other thing about uh, the ancient world that they tended to do was there was a split level uh, meaning to what they wrote. And so like they would write a story that has all this symbolic meaning, this mystical meaning. And it's about this higher idea right here. And Origen specifically talks about this. The Church Father Origen says, now, if you try to read these scripture literally, it's crazy. It makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> you have to interpret them spiritually. And uh, we have uh, other responses to pagan uh, skeptics who were saying things like, well, the Sea of Galilee is not really a sea, it's a lake, and you can't really, it only takes two hours to cross it, so you can't, and it's not big enough to have, you know, major hurricanes and stuff like that, and storms like that. Um, uh, and he was pointing out all these arguments that still hold up today. And in response, the monk who responded to him was saying that, uh, well, he said a bunch of things like, well, God can call it a sea because he created water, you know, but his main argument, and he spends page after page saying this, is, is the spiritual meaning of it is this, the ship is our life, this is this, this is that. Um, and he, the fact that it could not happen in real life doesn't bother him at all because he's worried about what the spiritual meaning is. And that's what Paul is talking about when he's talking about meat and milk and how your baby's in the faith. And so you only hear the story about Jesus did this, but it's really about talking about oh, this see. thing here, um, where there's an astrological motif or a numerological motif. That's interesting. Or so so, other so back then, being a literalist was kind of a sign of being like immature and not really being it, familiar with spiritual reading. Today, exactly. if you're not a literalist, it's a kind of sin and disobedience. Right. And John Dominic Crossan has a great quote about that. And let me see if I can remember it. It was something about it's not that they wrote these things uh, spiritually and were, were smart enough to take it literally. It's there. They wrote them spiritually and were dumb enough to take it literally. Um, I I'll have to I have to make sure I'm saying that right, not getting it wrong. But that's the basic gist of it is that these I, things were not meant to be taken literally. Yeah, and yet for me, when I'm looking at it, at least where I'm when I'm gaining a, a wider appreciation for for Christianity and other religions, is I I, I had a conversation with um, someone from the Baha'i faith just this week, and it was fascinating. I mean, he's mm -hmm. like a minister, or at least he was trained as a minister, and so I really, you know, I found that fascinating, found that really interesting, and I said to him, I go. I'm going to descend into the subject with two words <clears throat> and it's going to be pretend and heuristic. Now I said to, before anybody answers anything, first of all, we have to understand that pretend there's not, there's not an, there's nothing in that word that I'm trying to convey that's being disrespectful or malevolent or yeah. condescending, right? Nothing at all. Zero. You're talking right. about the power of imagination. And exactly. That. Yeah. And 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 then the, the heuristic is anchored in wisdom of ritual. And I'm saying, wait a minute, everybody just get on the same page for a minute. And I say, 
take that and try and understand from a creative standpoint, how do you make, how do you write a novel with a thematic sort of something that can bind people together in a period of time where they didn't have, like that's their, that's their mechanism for conveying information. Yeah. You know, going back to Homer, the sing-songing, right? Mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. How do you think grandpa told grandson about the, yeah. you know, the war heroes? And it's interesting you bring up Homer because Homer is another figure that we know there was at least two of them, if not more, because the Homeric epics are straddling different times where at one point they're talking about bronze weapons, another point they're talking about uh, iron weapons, that kind of thing. Uh, these anachronisms that show that at a certain point, these are generational stories being told, not just by one guy. I will add that what I, with my, you know, just dipping my toe into what Orthodox Christianity is all about right now in a, in a, in a contemporary sense, I'm, I'm, I think the idea was that they're, it's about that synthesis between the, the, the Hellenic, the pagan gods, and then the Jewish. Yeah. That's it's totally about a synthesis. It's about trying to come up with something. And so you you have historical figures in the past that try and 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 make that convergence happening happen. And so the the story is actually transcending. It's actually more to me, it's more beautiful that it right. isn't anchored in a particular right. time. When I read like, the Gethsemane story now, the way Mark meant it as not a super god like he's in Gospel of John, but as a guy who's a normal human being, raised just like us, but was super faithful to God, goes in the Garden of Gethsemane and realizes that God wants him to be give himself up as a sacrifice, and he's not sure he can go through with it. Boy, that story has so much more resonance than just a god slumming for a weekend, um, the way it is in the Gospel of John and the way we understand it. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, well, you know, in the next atheist convention, you know, I'll, you know, I'll come as a, you know, and I, I like to call myself a recovering atheist. Now, I don't want to <laughs> piss anybody off here, but I said, I said, it's such an odd, perverse word to to have for it, for mm -hmm. because you're defining by something, you're defining yourself by something you're not. Yeah, I find it the most, like, it, it's just such an odd label. And I take your point. I, I like what Douglas Adams said. He says, I like to call myself a radical atheist because that way everyone knows exactly what I'm talking about. They don't think there's some kind of agnostic, you know, wishy-washiness going on somewhere. Uh, yeah. And I, but and I take. Your well, point. I'm, I'm being a little bit more tongue in cheek. I say I'm a. Yeah, no, and, and, but I'm, I say I'm doing a. I'm a recovering atheist. You know, once an atheist, all is an atheist. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. But that's that might you know get with a little bit of bad. <laughs> Well, it's funny. Atheism has become a hard place to be over the last five years or so. Ever since uh, the the Trump years and even before that, the Bernie-Hillary divide really ripped apart the uh, community in a way we have not recovered from yet. Um, and that's a very human thing about our movement. Um, and it's a hard place to be, and yet all my favorite people are still in it. So, and what? and it's the the thing is is that it's 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 a very United States. You, there's a uniqueness to that to that struggle in the United States, just yeah. like there's a unique brand of Christianity that's in the United States. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Scott, what do you what do you think? Well, I was thinking, um, David, what's your view on this? So uh, here's one option, three options. It's it's all myth. Uh, these Jews loved some set of popular pagan myths of the time. They really, really loved it, and they're looking for any excuse to adopt it. So they did what they could to bring it in and and Jewify it. The second one is partial. So you have a, they love these fake pagan myths, and actually they, there were some apocalyptic prophets ready to hand to act as canvases to paint these things onto. Mm -hmm. And then the third option is there actually was a real person whose situation either resonated with an old myth or it could be mended by it. So let's say Jesus really did piss them off at Passover and he's executed with every other person who, who, who fooled around that way. Right. And right. then they thought, hey, we can bring Osiris in right now and also mix in Yahweh's demand for blood and, and we, can, we can get both. Right. So, uh, so what do you think? All myth with, with anything? Partial myth with canvases that kind of fit it? Or, or, or a person inspired it and the myth is right. ready to go in? Right. I, I will hedge my bet ever so slightly and say 
it's all myth, and those myths came out of like all the uh, the different. Mm-hmm. Let me back up. There were apocalyptic prophets in the first century were a dime a dozen of first century and even in the second century. Uh, there were a ton of them. And there were so many of them because there were these rebooted prophecies from Jeremiah and Daniel that had to keep being rejiggered uh, to make it work. And it kept pushing the, the goalposts further and further into the first century. Right. And that's why all these uh in my humble opinion, I agree with the scholars who think this is what's happening, is that that's why there's so many apocalyptic prophets at the time, is because they were following these rejiggered scriptures, um, which put it at that time. Christianity itself uh, came out of that, and also this Hellenistic movement of these personal savior faiths. And Christianity looks just like someone said, hey, if we were going to do a Jewish version of this, what would our look like, you know? Well, you'd have a son of God, but, you know, God's only one. So uh, he's his name would be Savior, you know, um, and there's so many names and places in the Gospels that are completely symbolic. If we knew Aramaic or, or, or Greek, it would sound like, oh, this guy came from Best Discipleville. And this miracle happened at, you know, incredibly apt miracle place. And his <laughs> the guy involved, his name means something very apt to this situation. Um, it was much more obviously uh, fictional uh, when you read the original language. And, and I think the Greeks were okay with that. Yeah. I yeah. think that and, was the most, that was the most, it doesn't get people excited. It's like, they, they, of course we know it's not real. Yeah. Right. And but there's the wisdom. Here's That's the thing. The thing. There was I don't think wisdom in it. I don't think it's a case like Joseph Smith trying to pull a fast one and become, you know, uh, a David Koresh type figure. I don't think that's how all the Christianity started. Certainly there were some that were like that. But most of them, I think we're saying we're talking about this, these exalted spiritual ideas about salvation and about numerology and astrology and other things that we don't care about. But they were very important to them. So they encoded them in these stories that we have about Jesus. In fact, um, in the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, there's a passage that blows my mind because Mark 4.11, he has Jesus talking to his uh, his disciples and saying, now, I'm telling these things in parables. That way, uh, you'll understand because I'll explain it to you in private, you in my inner circle. But people outside, they won't understand what I'm really talking about. Otherwise they would repent from their sins and be saved. Uh, Okay, that makes perfect sense if we're talking about a mystery faith where you have to be in the club to get the the true, you know, uh, the the real deal. It makes no sense whatsoever if this is Jesus who came just to save everybody who believes in him. Makes no sense at all. And yet that's still in our gospel. That's still in our New Testament. Yeah. Mark 411, eh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mark, one one of many passages where it's obvious that people like Paul were running a mystery faith, and that was what they're. I think the 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 slight for me the slight uh, the higher probability of the way I see this form was that it was um, you know a fractured time. There is a synthesis going on, but there's authentic people trying to create, and yeah, the it, a lot of it happened organically. So you can't have you know, you can have some degree of social engineering, and that's why it's a little bit irksome when someone says, "Oh, well, there's just a way to control people." Well, wait yeah, a minute. I agree. I agree. It's I like, don't think that's what it was. So it, it comes from the bottom up, and also from... in the time of Constantine, it definitely was. And by yeah. with the rise of the bishops, it definitely was. But yeah, I don't think it started that way either. I don't even think it started as one thing. It started as many different things, several different things, many, and many it went things, yeah. serious stages, yeah. Uh, and not all of them survived. And like, for instance, John the Baptist was the head of his own cult during his time. And even if you read the Gospels, the Christians are constantly fighting. The disciples are constantly fighting with John disciples, John the Baptist disciples. And we have writings from the second century talking about the debates that Christians and uh, Baptists had about who was the real Messiah, John the Baptist or Jesus. Um, we can even talk about, we know that these are myths about Jesus, these gospels, whether there was a real Jesus or not. It's an open question whether they are myths about John the Baptist, 
Robert mm. Price has made an interesting question. Uh, was John the Baptist really who they were talking about in the Jesus uh, stories? We can talk about that a whole episode just on that. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I don't know how everybody's doing. It might, you know, be worth, uh, where, where are you at, with Scott, with your questions and your timeline for tonight? How's everybody's time as we come across? I'm fine. You're fine? I was, I was going to ask a question a minute ago. Uh, so uh, the idea of uh, Jesus as an avatar slash incarnation of Yahweh, yeah. is this a copy of the Hercules story because they want to show that he's worthy of listening to? Or is this what happens when Greeks and Romans hear the meaningless phrase, son of God, which in Hebrew means absolutely nothing. But in, in Greek mythology, you have this template ready to go. Or right. is this the Gnostic idea of a quintessence entity descending through spheres and then coming into the mud to lift us up. So which of those three things is the real original motivator for the incarnation? Oh, the, the, the one true Christianity was, wait for it, drum roll, all of those things and other things that we've lost since. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it, there's no such thing as one original Christianity because this was starting all over the Roman Empire, all through the first century. Um Oh, and, and maybe even earlier. For all we know, there was proto-Christian movements happening before Jesus was meant to have uh, born. There, there were definitely uh, Christians who thought that Jesus was uh, crucified in the time of Alexander Janias, 100 years before our Jesus was born. Um, whether they were just getting their math wrong or if they really thought this had happened that far back, um, that we still have their writings making those arguments. So, um, so, so in a sense, it could be like a political movement. I think of Barack Obama and some of his most recent or his his last speeches when he was in the office. It's like he, that man is talented. He can he can in a speech give attribution to almost everybody, like almost every American one by one. You know, <laughs> it seems right. So it's like you politicize it in a way that you're trying to make it all inclusive. You know, of this like movement. Yeah, I'd be, I, I, I take a little umbrage about the politicizing word because they were like socially invisible for centuries. But when you look at something like Luke, Luke for sure was trying to create a big tent Christianity. He was reaching out to women. He was reaching out to Jews. He was reaching out to Pharisees. He was reaching out to everybody. Um, he wanted to include everybody in his Christianity. And he, it's so funny when you read Acts and Luke, and you read the, the letters of Paul, at every point where those there's an overlap between what Luke says Paul did and what Paul says Paul did, Luke is lying. He's getting it wrong, and he's trying to make it look like they're all one big happy family, and he's whitewashing over all these fractures that were tearing apart the early Christians. And there was, there was massive uh, civil war going on in early Christianity. Uh, you've got the Jerusalem temple, uh, the Jerusalem Christians who were basically Jews that were Jesus Jews. You've got Paul, who's like, nope, I'm the the apostle to the Gentiles, and we don't, we're not going to get circumcised. We're losing that. That's just not good branding. Uh, we're going to go with a different approach. And uh, hey, David, you brought up the, uh, you know, you brought up the circumcision. So you know, you have one little footnote in there that's, uh, you know, what is it, twelve, twelve, fourteen? Of I believe there's fourteen, 14 holy. <laughs> foreskins of jesus it paid paraded around in the middle ages yeah along with enough pieces of the true cross uh, i forget the exact quote something like you could build a galleon ship out of all the pieces of the true cross in the middle ages i, I have a question where, where did yeah. the anti-sex stuff come from oh god yeah um uh, well they weren't all anti-sex there is some really interesting gnostic versions of christianity that do get into sex but by and large uh, Christianity was not just anti-sex, but anti-flesh, anti-this world. Uh, everything in this world is bad, bad, bad. Everything about flesh sucks. Um, it's all lust. It's all meat bags. It's terrible. And we're going to get new bodies when we go to heaven. It'll be awesome. And uh, no matter what, how much you suffer now, it'll all be worth it. So forget this life. Yeah. But but there is an ulterior mo motive in in that. That's to try and get the to emphasize the pair bond. Right. And so you're trying to get you're, you're, you're trying to say, yes, it's it's um, unpure thoughts. But in the right, uh, you know, structure in a home with a husband and a, you know, a blessed union, this is 
Well, you don't see that coming from Paul. Paul is like, mm. well, if you have to do something silly like go out with a girl, yuck, you know, go ahead, I guess. You know, it's better to do that than burn with passion. But really, there's no time. God is going to be here any minute now. The Lord is going to descend. So, you know, TikTok, you know, don't waste your time on any frivolous things like girls or money or anything else. Uh, it's all about Jesus. Yeah. Well, there's even some wisdom with that with Socrates, right? Like he's been able to say that that's past. It's it's kind of like washed away from his body and he's no, yeah, it's no longer think, a concern, right? But I think it's a little more toxic in Christianity because in the beginning, yeah. it's like, no, the whole world isn't a doomsday cult. Nothing matters here. It's all flesh is grass. This is all paper in the fire. You know, don't get attached to this world. Go away. It's not until generations later when they realize, Oh, this generation passed away, and we're all still here. This, you know, you know. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Oh, this, this scripture here, and at, in fact, even in the Gospels themselves, you see Mark is clearly written right after the destruction of Jerusalem because he practically includes a survival guide in his Gospel to the people who are surviving the the, the aftermath of that Jewish war. Whereas Matthew and Luke are saying things like. Um, having the disciples ask things about how uh, everyone's died off now and we're still here. And, and, and he has his Jesus say things that are a little more expansive about, Oh, I didn't mean this generational passive way. I mean, you know, in the, you know, a day unto the Lord's like a thousand years. So it could be, you know, it keeps getting pushed back further and further and further, just the same way that we saw with Jeremiah's prophecies and Daniel's prophecies and the reboots of those. Um, so you're saying that the anti-sex stuff wasn't special. It was on the same level with anything having to do with it being enmeshed in matter because the, the name of the game right. is extracting yourself from matter. But does it seem more. that there's Paul more. actually does have a special interest in sex and it's not just the, 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 the Gnostic danger of becoming too wrapped up in matter, but there's actually something extra special about it? Well, here's the thing. I mean, when you talk about Paul and sexuality, we could talk a whole episode about how in my humble opinion, he was a homosexual and self-loathing, and that was his the thorn in his side that he's constantly complaining about. Um, it seems like he was not interested in women whatsoever, um, and he would much rather hang out with his beloved brother Timothy or his beloved slave boy Onesimus or his beloved brother Barnabas or all these other guys who he instructs to meet with a holy kiss and... You know, um, when he talks about wanting to get a wife, he's talking about we want to get sister wives so someone can do the cooking and cleaning for us. But, you know, the thought of actually having sex with them, the, the early Christianity is filled with stories where even married couples stop having sex because sex is bad. You know, mm okay, sex is bad. Flesh is bad. Um, and, it, and the exception, not the rule, um, it brings in sexuality. Um, you've got things like the secret gospel of Mark that um, intimates, if it's not a forgery, and we could talk about that for a whole show too, uh, that the naked boy who runs from the Garden of Gethsemane uh, at the time of Jesus' arrest was Jesus' lover. And he and, and there's a whole thing about that, that if true, the Carpocratian sect was talking about, uh, and Clement is warning us about it. That's assuming it's true or not. Yeah. And it could be an elaborate hoax by a 20th century uh, Bible scholar. We could we could spend all night going down these rabbit holes. Yeah, yeah. Erwin mentions that and discards this uh, Jesus was a homosexual idea. Yeah, I the do idea too. Was that it was just, it's, it's against Judaism to not have as many kids as possible. Yeah. And it's bizarre to see rabbis that aren't married. So, so it must be something like that going on. Right. Though, again, we have to be careful about the things we think we know about Jesus because we know about the context of first century Judaism. I see that game played all the time that, oh, we know so much about Jesus, blah, 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 because we know what it was like for male uh, Jude is in the first century Palestine. Um, very dangerous uh, game to play. Cause you can do the same thing with hobbits. I mentioned in, in uh, my book that we can say, oh, well, Bilbo's house must've been not a, dry bare sandy hole or a nasty wet hole but it was a hobbit hole and that means comfort you know and you know, it's it's like it's so circular it's so circular but it doesn't tell us anything about the real person it only tells us about what a person of that a character from that time would have been like 
So this re this reminds me to the question I wanted to ask for the last month, ah. which is if the pure myth theory is true, yeah. why do two things? Why mm -hmm. the dissimilarity where, where they have things in there that are embarrassing that, that they want ah. to change? Like, like, like why, why, why bother moving from Nazareth to Bethlehem, making Bethlehem to begin with? And the second question, which is kind of like that one, is have him divine from the beginning. Instead, in Mark, there's no virgin birth. He's just a, he's just a teacher. Yeah. Over time, he changes, changes, changes. And then in the late writings, like Gnostic and John, He's, he's completely divine. So there's two problems, the similarity yeah. and movement from mortal to divine. If, if your theory is true, shouldn't he be divine from the get-go? Well, here's the thing. There's even more uh, examples that you could have brought up, too. Um, how much time do we have to talk about this? Because, again, this could be a whole episode. Do we have much time? A lot yeah. of time? Well, you know, we've got let's, – let's bench it on a half an hour, and then okay. we'll wrap it up, and then we can always return to, the, you know, to these and dig in a little bit deeper. Gotcha. Well, in a nutshell, I'll just say that issues like that, for instance, the Bethlehem versus Nazareth thing, uh, the women uh, eyewitnesses thing, there's all these things that are brought up as, well, wouldn't they have fixed that? Um, and especially when it comes to the criteria of embarrassment, because what embarrassed Mar Matthew and Luke, very obviously, did not bother Mark whatsoever. Things that embarrassed uh, John uh, well, that's a bad example. He was the last. Things that John found embarrassing, he switches, he changes. He has no compulsion about changing them. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the who originally written, uh, Mark's Jesus was not perfect from birth. It didn't bother him to have a fallible Jesus who could fuck up sometimes when he's doing a miracle or lose his temper or be a dick to like Gentile women. He was, you know, that was his guy. As long as he was... Uh, made him special is that he was god chose him picked him as the son of his birth and he stayed faithful all the way through to the end even death on a cross um that was mark's jesus that wasn't matthew's jesus that wasn't luke's jesus that wasn't john jesus and i i think that fallibility of jesus actually came to a pinnacle when um i i think it was the the devil had whispered in his ear and tried to tempt him yeah. you know just before the Romans were coming to get him. Even the fact that the devil, that he immediately, after he's uh, declared to be God's son, he immediately goes into a testing period to see if he's worthy of that. That's a hit and a half that we're talking about a mortal man, because none of that uh, makes any sense if you've got the third person of the Trinity who helped create the universe. Nothing Satan throws at him is going to make a dent if, it's, if that's that guy. If it's a human? Sure, absolutely. It makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. And I have to insert, it makes perfect sense if it was a human-created story. Not oh, to debunk yeah. it, right. but think of that from a wisdom standpoint. Sure. That us as a collective body of humans can be tempted to go down a path that we shouldn't be. And until people, in my humble opinion, until we can start having a conversation around what is the wisdom that we're looking at as opposed to, you know, trying to, like, can't they understand a make-believe story? Can't yeah. they understand myth? Can't they understand the value of myth? And here's the thing. You know what? If more Christians said it that way, said, look, these are our stories. We get great meaning out of them. I would have so much more respect than them saying, this really happened and you have to believe that or you're a bad person. And it's all true, but even the stuff that does, disagrees with each other. Um, I would have so much more respect for more Christians um, if they treat it as the folklore that it is, as the mythology that it is. And it's easier to get the fine value in it. And you can you can separate the stuff that, well, that made sense in the first century doesn't make any sense now. Your sexism, your homophobia, fill in the blank, um, your Judeocentrism, your Gentilocentrism, you know, depending on who's writing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now, I do think that there is a there is a self preserving function in that um, in 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 the fact that it doesn't um, al allow the, the, the leader, the reader or the listener to participate in in some sort of like open homogeneous type of thing. I think it's it's a form of. Um, it, it, it protects a culture, right? I, and I kind of discovered this idea when I was talking to a Muslim friend. And I said to him, so you start to really understand, like, why is it, 
Why is it protecting? Why does it start to form like a nationalistic type of identity to it? Mm -hmm. Why does it create, and here's the the thing, an us versus them? Right. It does have this ability, right. and it's one of the ways that it grabs onto our, our psychology. When someone yep. says, well, that's not what I believe. We believe this, but you believe that. That's right. powerful. That just digs right in. Absolutely. And it, and, it, and, it, and it provides something that like just anchors right into the, you know, the hooks anchor right into our psychology. Absolutely. And right now, uh, I'm working on a book on sex and violence in the Bible. So I'm really digging deep into the Old Testament. It is fascinating to see the psychology of the writers of the Old Testament. Um, and when you when the, you lay out what their motives are and like how the Old Testament disagrees with itself, this book disagrees with this book, this prophet disagrees with this prophet, um, even though they're all supposed to be on the same team, they're not. And they're saying very different things and contradicting each other in very different ways. And it's especially between the, the Israel Northern Kingdom prophets and the Judah um, Southern Kingdom prophets. The rivalry of that is fascinating. Yeah, and, and see, I would describe I would describe this as something reflective of human nature. We do, we are novel seeking querents. We are going to do that, but we want to differentiate, right? We want to be able to bring something novel and new to the equation. Right. right? And, oh, and, your your Old Testament thing. I wanted to ask you about this. Yeah. Have you done anything on, on the book of Esther? I love the book of Esther. It's the only book in the Old Testament that doesn't mention the word God once. Uh, yeah. And, well, the reason lots why, of sex in it. Lots of sex in it, too. Yeah. Yeah. But the, but the reason why I brought it up is I was, uh, I, I enjoyed a reading of Esther with my son. And he brought up to the point, he brought the point up to me. Uh, he brought the point, uh, well, we discussed the point yeah. of Esther being a, a comedy. Hmm. And... And that I was like, I even talked to an Orthodox Jew friend of mine and he said, what comedy? And I had to, I had to explain to him, you know, comedy tragedy sort of scenario, right? He had a mental hurdle to get over to figure out that, well, it's not comedy like Three's Company or sitcom or something like that, but, but it's a bad guy getting his comeuppance in a, in ah, a yeah. Or poking yeah. fun and there's a function to it. Right. And so there's yeah. a function to Esther. Now, what was really interesting about the interpretation and what I have a lot of respect for the for Judaism is. Um, they are very cultural in their life lesson. Right. So what my son and I did is we went and got a, a Greek comedy and it was much more situational, mistaken identity <laughs> and this <laughs> and that. And, you know, contrived, like, contrived uh, you know, this kind yeah. of stuff. Right. Yeah. But the Jewish, the, the, the thing from a, of the Jewish tradition was much more of a longer cultural linear sort of like, you see this generation and that is going to happen. And we told you so, and, you know, we'll be persecuted in this life but not mm -hmm. in the next one mm -hmm. it's so long and it's got this it's got this very um like long cultural like wisdom sort of motif through it and i thought that was really insightful for you know two guys that don't really <laughs> spend a lot of time <laughs> in the life there's uh, yeah and I, again i apologize we're gonna go down another rabbit hole but another thing that i've been finding again and again in the old testament is a story that originally was probably kind of body, probably kind of naughty and racy, and they're, they've been elevating it. Um, or it's a mean story, and it's not a nice story, and they've exalted it a little bit and made the, made the situation a little more noble uh, and smoothed out the rough edges of it. Um, and especially when you see that, like, clearly they were dealing with an oral tradition that everybody knew. So they couldn't say, they couldn't totally just dis, dis, discard it, jettison it. They had to reinterpret it in a different way. And that, seeing that process has been really fascinating to me and making me afraid that this book is going to be really another big monster of a book. Yeah, uh, that's, that's an interesting process. Uh, Joseph Campbell talks about this. So it's it's only the sacred things that have to be turned evil. Mm -hmm. So it's like, 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 like pigs, for example, pigs were a sacred animal. So uh, you, you can't just say, forget about the pigs. You have to say, actually, pigs are positively bad. And, and that way you, you get to, uh, you, you, you answer the question about why they're important at all. So, yeah, so yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. 
Uh, but I, I still have this question from earlier. So, so oh, sure. if you could summarize your answer. So yeah, if, if the mythicist story is true and yeah. these people are just taking in a whole cloth Dionysian, dying God, resurrection, salvation, Gnostic stuff. Yeah. And um, why all this fallible human stuff? And why why these stories about the uh, where he's where he's merely human and fallible? Why why, well, why not have him godlike all the way through like he is in John? Well, when you look at at some of the other pagan gods, they did weird things too. Like, uh, yeah. uh, uh, who is the uh, the Thracian god that uh, uh, what is his name um, that he uh, castrates himself basically um, and his and his followers do too um, there were there were things that they did were very ungodly in our eyes um, and yet uh, it, it made perfect sense from an allegorical standpoint um, things like for instance uh, the trial of Jesus and when he, they bring out Barabbas uh, and has and, and Pontius Pilate has this custom that the, you can choose who to release, and will you do this fierce anti-Roman murderer, or will you do the guy you were just worshiping as King of the Jews twelve hours ago? And there's nothing in that story at all that makes any sense historically, logically, even from a Jewish standpoint. Everything about it is so wrong and dogpiled so fast. Like, well, that could never happen on Hanukkah. That could never happen on the Passover. That they would have just, you know, none of this would happen this way. And yet, as an allegory for Yom Kippur, it makes perfect sense. Jesus losing his temper and cursing a fig tree makes no sense from a divine standpoint. Makes perfect sense if that fig tree is a representation of the people of Israel and how they didn't yield fruit but they died uh you know uh because mm -hmm. he cursed them that makes perfect sense from an allegorical standpoint and we see that again and again and again and again things that are weird to us make perfect sense allegorically and from the old testament stories that they came from originally many of them and I think we can, I think the, the, it becomes the reading, the readings become much more enjoyable. Like, wouldn't you be able to say like, I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, with a broad brushstroke, uh, like eliminate all, all of your work. Right. But no, I mean, if, honestly, if everybody I, agreed to it and we were just enjoying it for the wisdom and, you know, but that's not what happens here. It's like, right. And as a human creation, I'm just endlessly fascinated to when another piece of the puzzle slides in, it's like, ah, uh, that's why there's this weird ass thing because this and this and that feeling of when another puzzle piece slides into position, that's what I live for. That's why after 22 years, I'm still fascinated by this thing, uh, by this whole uh, phenomenon. And yeah, yeah. The, fact, the fact that it's not just Christianity, but you can do that for every religion out there as well blows my mind you know and to, and to point you know to point with you know I, I guess maybe an extension of what scott's point was and where he was going with that i mean you know it, it, in judaic faith right in the jewish faith you know there's there's contradictions there's you know abraham doesn't always act the way he should and king david is fallible right i mean he there was that story of of king david um uh, doing that thing and with it, the adulteress, and then trying to buy off the guy right. and Bathsheba, and, and and yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Like the, yeah. And, it, and why put that in there, right? Because it, then it explains why his kingdom fell later. Is but same with Solomon. It's like uh, we we <clears throat> yeah, another rabbit hole. But when you talk about David and Solomon, they're two figures that were probably some kind of history, but they definitely were not historic in the way that say like Hezekiah or Josiah was from figures from 400, 500 years later. Uh, the real Jesus, the real, sorry, the real David was nothing like King David. The kingdom of David was nothing like the kingdom of David, the, the, the bandit chieftain of David. That, that just did not exist yet. Uh, and archeologically, we know that. From historically, we know that, um, and over the last thirty years, it's become very, very obvious that that story did not happen. Uh, Russell Gamerican has done some amazing work on Solomon, arguing that everything we know about Solomon 
is probably based on Shalmaneser III, the Assyrian king, and his kingdom. Um, and so I've been trying to parse out what's real about the Solomon story and what's real about David's story. Um, and um, it, it's fascinating to see how those came together, too. Yeah. And we see the same things at work all throughout Judaism and Christianity and Islam, for that matter, too. We see the same things happening there, too. Okay, well, we're getting down to the last 10 minutes, so I want everybody to kind of start thinking of this. Uh, you know, stay away from the rabbit holes because we're going to have lots to go down with, you know, a, a once-a-month visit here. Um, Scott, what's what's percolating over there? Well, my, my last question is, do you think that the Son of Man character is primary like uh, Ehrman does? Uh, because Jesus has these strange quotes where he's talking about the Son of Man in the third person, and later on Christians are like, oh, oh, you forgot how to use the first person here. He's talking about himself <laughs> in the third person. That yeah. so, makes me so sick. But but uh, the uh, Ehrman's idea, as you know, is that uh, uh, Jesus was a follower of John the Baptist, and John the Baptist had a Son of Man cult. So Jesus was saying the same thing John was, except he's saying, plus, after he comes, I'm going to be installed as president, and you guys get to be my cabinet. What do you think about that? The, the short answer is, I'm not sure. Son of Man thing, there's a lot to it. And there's a lot of possibilities of it and very little certainty about what it could have meant. And I, I don't think I don't even I don't feel qualified to answer it. And I haven't been really convinced by anybody else's one true answer for that question. Um, that's a tough one. I, I think it has more. Well, I mean, we, we can agree that it has has roots in the in the Hellenic well, there's definitely multiple meanings meanings fooling around there, and that's part of the problem. Uh, trying to pin it down to one thing. Um, I mean, in a in a in one sense, son of man was just a phrase for dude, a dude, you know, a son of Adam, uh, son of man. It's a guy, and so on one level, that's what that means. But there, we're talking about multiple levels of meaning being thrown about, and I don't know which one necessarily was being used if, or if more than one. Oh, I, I, in, in my example, as you know, I was talking about the, the Daniel son of man who's going to come down on a cloud with a sword and then kick the uh, robot's uh, ass. The apocalyptic figure, yeah. Right, right. Um, so so, yeah. so, Jesus and John were both saying, hey, zealots, Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes, y'all have it wrong. The real response to the Roman occupation is just wait. God will send that character from Daniel on a cloud, and he'll behead all the damn bastards. And, all, and by the way, if you follow me instead of John, you get to be in my in my presidential cabinet. And and so that's that's Herman's yeah. take. Yeah, um, and I think as far as historical Jesus theories go, that's not the most implausible I've ever heard. Most of the, most theories like that, uh, the reconstructions of Jesus are plausible. Uh, very few of them, I think, are just completely wackadoodle, like the Roman invention or that Flavius Josephus invented it, or it was all a, a mystery play that was uh, written down like an, uh, a, an actual drama performed. And it may have, um, but uh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Okay, so my, uh, my last question has to do with, uh, you know, crossing the river, the Rubicon, and uh, what, what, what parallels can you bring there? And is it really a apt comparison to compare you know, the potential controversy behind the, you know, the Rubicon crossing of Caesar and, and right. the Jesus myth. What you're talking about is a, a Christian apologist, Douglas Gavette, said, claimed quite infamously that the evidence for Jesus is, is, is on par with anything like, for instance, Caesar's crossing the Rubicon. And my friend Richard Carrier, Dr. Richard Carrier, pointed out step by step by step how that is so laughably untrue and the opposite is in fact true that for the rubicon story we have multiple lines of evidence of every kind from physical evidence to brute fact that it couldn't have happened unless he really had done it it's not just that people believed he did or they told a story about him doing it he really had to have done that for that to have happened uh two physical accounts two co contemporary accounts uh to physical evidence all the way down the line for Jesus, we have absolutely, for five out of six of those, we have nothing whatsoever. And the one line of evidence that we do have propping up anything he did in his life is not the best kind of evidence, but the worst kind of evidence. Anonymous guys being falsely uh, passed off as eyewitnesses who are clearly writing generations removed from the time they describe anonymously without any kind of historical 
historiography about what their sources were, how trustworthy the sources were, or anything like that. And they claim explicitly that they're writing these stories so that you will believe in this new religion they're selling. Yeah, mm. that's that's not just bad evidence. That's the worst evidence. Yeah. So the thought that that Jesus, if you toss out uh, Jesus, you have to toss about everybody in the ancient world. No, no, um, no. There's everything we believe about anything that happened in the ancient world is provisionally based on how many lines of evidence support it and what kind of evidence and how good is that evidence. And even if Christianity is true, even if there was a Jesus, no matter whether it's true or false, the evidence for Jesus is crappy by any standard, ancient standards and modern standards. It's terrible. Yeah. Like the, what was the, that controversy for a while? The, sh the shroud of shroud Turin? Of yeah, I cannot believe they're still beating that dead horse. I mean, they've done the test. They know when it was made. They've, you know, it. yeah, the fact that they're still trying to milk that cash cow blows my mind. And there's one church that has blood that liquefies one day a year, and they carry that around. That's yeah. my favorite. St. Janaeus, I think that is. Uh, yeah. Um, there's, I mean, there's miracles and, and things aplenty. Um, yeah. It's it's kind of fascinating. And the ones that that true believers hold up for one religion, they don't convince anybody outside their faith, you know, would, no matter who you're talking about, whether it's, you know, this bush grew in the, the word Arabic word for Allah or, you know, uh, you know, Shroud of Turin or the Statue of Lords, you know, you name it. Elvis. <laughs> Walking. That seems to be what we're up against. I'm going to, you know, speak for all of us here. It, 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 say we're all, you know, it's all truth seekers, right? We're trying to figure out what we're, you know, trying to really ask a question to trying to find out what the truth is. But, yeah, you know, we're digging, right? And the thing is, is that I find that we're, when, when we're asking those questions, the responses that are given, we're put into that same category of, well, that's not what I believe. And so that our, even our questioning is, is, yeah. is, you know, taken as something that is threatening their belief. Yeah, and people don't care if you lose your religion. They just don't want you to lose their religion. Yeah. And no, last, really night, last night, I was watching that Tom Hanks biopic of Mr. Rogers. And one thing that really struck me is Mr. Rogers was basically a living saint. He, they, they actually specifically said they don't like, uh, he didn't like being called that. But I mean, this is a guy who has a really amazing capacity to love and his he's informed by his faith and at the same time he talks to kids with puppets and uh they go into the magical land of make-believe every week um and he has a strong sense of being able to pass these mythological lessons through make-believe and it's like his faith in god to me is just another subset of that. And uh, and whenever mm -hmm. I talk to a Christian, you know, if, it, if your Christianity makes you a better person and a more compassionate person um, and makes the world a better place, you know what? I'm all for it. I, yeah. will, I will support you in being the best Christian you can be. Um, I can't do it because I have this weird hang up on things that are true and not true. And Yes, there's truth in myth, but it's not the same kind of truth as truth in science and empirical fact. And I'm kind of a stickler for that kind of thing. It's like, God's done a lot of messed up things, and I can forgive him for all that. But for not existing, I just can't quite let him off the hook for that. Let's you have know, Joseph Campbell's uh, famous phrasing of that. He says, um, uh, "What uh, a journalism is, is about what... what what happened but myth is about uh, what happens <laughs> i love that so it's so it's a it's a it's a psychological in, interpretation i've heard and, pastors say things like uh the whole bible is true some of it happened right 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 oh no actually, actually I, I got the quote wrong it's um myth isn't about what happened it's about what happens so in other words uh, it's it's you're like externalizing that. deep psychological processes 
in yeah. uh, in a picture story way that anyone can can understand because we we need to have metaphors for our internal states because Absolutely. they're visible to us. Absolutely, it's yeah. art. It's art, and art is important. Imagination is important. Novels are important. Uh, fiction is important. But and this yeah, is the challenge of our time. You know, Richard Rory talks about we know so much now that it's hard to really take anything. You know, this is the postmodern mm -hmm. condition. No one can really give their heart to any particular belief system. We know that these things are historically constructed, socially constructed. So, so uh, the question is. Can you be something like like Mr. Rogers, who uses uh, Christianity as like a uh, as a battery for being a really great person, yeah. but also kind of wink at yourself at the same time and say, and by the way, it, it's not actually literally true. So, so how do you how do you get that that, that in, the encouragement juice out of a religion and be ironic about it at the same time? Absolutely, Daniel. Did we cut you off earlier? It seemed like you were about to say something. No, I no, I'm good. This is good stuff. It seems yeah. like now it's just really ramping up. <laughs> Yeah. And, and again, it's kind of a good note to end on is because like we're not saying necessarily that religion is bad. I tend there's a great quote about religion tends to make good people better and bad people worse. Um, and I, I I find a lot of that resonates with me. Um, but for us, when you ask, is it true? What kind of truth are we talking about? And. um you know, and it, it depends how you approach these stories. And but but knowing how these stories came about, knowing that these are human constructions, that this is like the one of the biggest art projects of all time that's been going on for hundreds and thousands of years. Um, and it has roots into other uh, connections and seeing the connectedness between all these different religious traditions, these passages, these stories um, and how they came together is so much more fascinating to me than trying to cram the whole universe into for in my case a southern baptist shaped box that it just doesn't fit um i felt so much more christ-like if you will once i get stopped being a christian uh and it was able to see all these people and our place in the universe it's like suddenly we weren't just you know strangers in a strange land just biding our time till we go to heaven it's like this is our home we came out of this we and everybody we meet are are part of this. Um, I love that, David. I, I became so much more Christ-like when I stopped being a Christian. Yeah. You know, like it, it, I, like I, I take my hat off to you. I think that's absolutely right. You think in you can really think in your day and orient yourself towards the truth. And I think if if there is a definition of a true Christian, they're going to understand that deep down they know that this is. You know, all of history can't say that. Yeah. But we can say that now in our contemporary tra tradition. And yeah. to, to Scott's point, yeah, we may want to like kind of run it through the digitizing software and only leave, you know, the, you know, the peaks of the signal and not leave the things that get, you know, from point A to point B. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know what, you know, why can't it be a, a piece of literature? Why can't it be a myth? Exactly. Calvin and Hobbes. There's so much yeah. truth in that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think the Buddhists would, would this would resonate with them as well. I think there's... Oh, well, um, get Scott going on the Buddhists. He gave a really great monologue of, uh, of, of uh, I guess, the origins of Buddha and the story and everything. So I'm excited with this series. And uh I'll, I'll kind of wrap it up here and I'll say, David, is there anything that you would like to kind of summarize in closing words about what you hope to get out of the series, um, uh, uh, you know, for the audience or even yourself personally? Well, in a nutshell, I want to thank everybody for listening to this and indulging me in talking about these things, especially because everything that we talk about brings up all this other things that we could be talking about. Um, and I'm excited to see where this takes us and uh, what we'll be talking about. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot to be said about all these things and more. The Myth of Jesus with David Fitzgerald.